Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's NAA iSeries webinar. I am Erin Ships, Director of Marketing and Communications for the National Auctioneers Association, and I would like to thank you for joining us for today's iSeries about negotiation. Through iSeries, the NAA shares free auction industry insights. As the world's largest association dedicated to auction professionals, the NAA educates and represents the interests of thousands of auction professionals worldwide. Today's session will be presented by John Hamilton. John Hamilton is a confirmed negotiation junkie from a small country town in Western Pennsylvania. His negotiating experiences include real estate, commercial construction, private consulting, and public service. John has conducted ne negotiating workshops in 49 of the 50 states and four Canadian provinces. He has presented at numerous state and national auctioneer conferences and has served on the CAI program faculty for more than 25 years. His book, Keep Negotiating, is a desk reference for good negotiators everywhere. The hallmark of John's programs is that they are rich in practical content and presented with a touch of energy and humor. Throughout his presentation, please note that you may take part in the conversation. Type and submit your questions at any time, and we will get to as many of them as we can during our brief Q&A period. After that, we will also ask you to please take part in a very short three-question poll. With that, John, welcome and take it away. Thank you, Aaron, and let me add my welcome to everybody on the webinar today, talking about my favorite subject, negotiating. And since our focus is on the auction business, negotiating a good deal should not be up for bid. Now let's realize something. Many people love to go to auctions because that's where they find the good deals. They hope to find that treasure that nobody else notices or wants, and they walk away with a good deal. But I got a question. What about the rest of the purchases in their lives? And what about auctioneers? Where do they get their good deals? Well, Chester Kara said it right. This well-known author and negotiating seminar leader said, in business and in life, Memphis, emphasis, in life, you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. So that's why I think negotiating is such a critical subject. But it comes with challenges, lots of challenges. And I'd like to address a couple of those challenges today in the short 15, 20 minutes we have together. The first challenge is when. When do we negotiate? I'm surprised the people that don't negotiate because they never think of when they could or better when they should. And once they know the when or we address the when, then comes how. How do you do it? How do you get started? Well, most people don't spend much time worrying about when or how to negotiate. I always picture them as giving up, not even trying. They just give the white flag. Let's face it, most Americans don't spend any time thinking about when and how to negotiate. And because of that, Americans are just plain lousy negotiators. We Americans take pride in being the tops in almost every aspect of life. But you know, when it comes to negotiating, I'm not sure we're very good. And we've got an excuse, three of them to be exact. First, we just don't do it very often. How good you can be if you don't do it? And when you come to Americans negotiating, they only are expected and only do negotiate two times regularly. One is when you buy a car, everybody knows, negotiate that. And we don't do well at it. Or when you buy or sell a house, again, you expect not to pay full price or accept low offers. But wait a minute, if that's the extent of our negotiating experience, do you see the problem? There are multiple years between negotiating experiences. So that's one reason we're not very good. And add to that, America is known around the world as the home of the one price store. Everything in the store has one price on it. And like sheep led to slaughter, we walk up with our credit card and money and pay whatever they ask without a whimper, without an objection, without even trying or thinking about getting a better deal. In addition to not doing it, we're really not sure what to do. And if you're not sure what to do, you probably wouldn't expose yourself to try it very often. I'm talking about negotiating training. I got into the negotiating game, I should say, by being elected to a school board in my little country town in Pennsylvania. I was put in charge of union negotiations and found myself immediately 
outgunned, out experienced by trained negotiators for labor unions. So I started studying it and it's made a huge difference in my personal negotiating as well. So if you don't do it and you're not sure what to do, what's the third nail in the coffin? Well, we just want to get past it. Americans, that includes you and me, are in a hurry. We can't wait to get it done. We'd rather pay full price than spend an extra minute trying to get a good deal. So my hope today is we're going to be able to change that. So let's address those when and how questions. When comes up first, and that is when do we negotiate? Well, maybe you need a visual cue. How about these two? Anytime you take a dollar bill or a credit card out of your pocket or purse, you've got to be thinking, is this an opportunity for me to bargain, to negotiate, to get a better deal? The answer is yes, yes, and yes again. But you've got to be ready for the opportunity when it comes up. And negotiating is not always simply dollars and cents. Prices and offers are family negotiations. We negotiate with our spouse, with our kids, with our relatives, with our neighbors, our cousins. And don't forget all the, the business negotiations with our own staff or with uh, committees at a church or a civic group where we're trying to get something done and you've got a great idea, you've got to sell it. You know what it is, it's called negotiating. So applying negotiating skills really permeates our lives a lot more than you think. And then we really fall short in the big ticket items. But you never thought I'd be recommending you spend more time negotiating big events like proms or weddings. When you think of how much money those things cost, why don't we try to get a better deal? And it's like, well, we must not love our new spouse if we try to get a better deal. I think you can't show love any more than trying to get a better deal. And when Uncle Harry dies and you plan his funeral, everybody's sad and everybody loses all common sense when it comes to paying for funeral services. Thousands and thousands of dollars are involved. Do you think he could save 100, 200? I'm betting he could save a lot more than that. And you say, I'm not sure I want to do that. Well, then pass on that. Just do negotiations using what I call the $100 mandate. Here it is. In addition to the dollars and credit cards you get out, ask yourself this question. How many times am I buying something that costs $100 or more? And if it does, I'm telling you, you need to negotiate. It's almost a mandate you do. You've got to ask yourself a question. If you're buying something in a store for $100 and you talk to the manager and ask if you could get 10 cents off, do you think he'd give you the 10 cents off? The answer is absolutely. And then you think, well, could I get a dollar or $10? You see, the more money's involved, the more likely you'll get a concession. So how do we do it? How is another big question. Well, the how is really pretty easy. And I'm going to start off with one thing. What is your immediate reaction when you hear a price or a proposal? Let's jump into a very routine situation. You have bought a new house. It's got a very small yard. You need a lawnmower, but you don't want to buy a new one. You find a lawnmower at a yard sale in the neighborhood and you ask the owner how much and he says well, i want a hundred dollars the critical win is is coupled with the how the win is you're going to spend a hundred dollars if you if you acquiesce to his price but how do you do it well the immediate reaction you give them when he gives you the price or the proposal which is a hundred dollars and that immediate reaction is called the flinch now, people who have been in my programs before and know that I put a lot of stock in the flinch. I'm going to ask you to consider something. When that guy that owned the house and had the yard sale and had the lawnmower responded to your question, how much do you want for the lawnmower? As he was saying, I want $100, I guarantee you, guarantee you, he is staring right in your face looking for your immediate reaction. And if your immediate reaction is absolutely calm, no reaction at all, guess what he's thinking? Gee, I'm going to get my $100. That price didn't even shock him. But if on the other hand, if you give him a flinch, a shock look, 
a grimace or maybe even an audible, oh, then all of a sudden the negotiations is on. Now I'm gonna challenge you to think about flinches and start watching for flinches. And let me add this real quick. If you have kids at home and you tell them to do something, see if they aren't excellent at coming up with a flinch. Their scowl, their grimace, their complaint is just classic. And when we adults just don't do it enough. Maybe you're joining this lady at the top that just kind of closes her eyes and rubs her brow. Or this guy here that looks shocked. Flinching has been around a long time. Some may remember the old television show Sanford and Son, Red Fox. That's the comedian here in the lower right hand corner. His signature flinch was he faked a heart attack. Anytime something didn't displease him, he said, oh, I'm coming, Elizabeth, I'm dying of a heart attack. Now, I don't think we're going to go over the top on that kind of play acting, but I would challenge you to do something. Develop your own signature flinch. What signal do you give people who give you a price or a proposal that you don't like it? Now, if you're an animated person, high energy, your flinch would probably be that way too. If you're low key, very, very calm, then all you might need is a wrinkled brow. Remember, they'll see it because they're staring at your face when they make their price of proposal. So flinching opens the door. How do you negotiate? You communicate that you're not going to accept the price of proposal automatically. It opens the door to bargaining. And I'm telling you, it's mandatory. You can flinch on the phone. I've even flinched on a fax and an email. It takes a little creativity, but you can get it done. So flinching is number one. If you visit my website, keepnegotiating.com, you'll see this visual of the boxer because I'm talking about negotiating one-two punch. As you see, it's easy to learn, comfortable to use, and really get some big results. Now the one-two punch, the first punch is a flinch. That's where you give that animated adverse reaction. The second is called the crunch. I don't know who came up with these terms. We don't have to use them. We just need to understand how to implement them. A crunch is when you ask somebody for a better deal before you even offer a counter. So when the gentleman asked, when you asked him how much he won for his lawnmower and he said $100 and you flinched him, whoa, didn't realize it'd be that much. Then you need to crunch him, which means you're going to right now ask him to improve his price in our favor before we even tell him how much we'd consider paying. And here's the great crunch. Is that the best you can do? Is that the best you can do? Very well may be the seven most powerful negotiating words on the planet. I will tell you, if you don't get anything out of my program today, get the flinch and get these seven words. Is that the best you can do? You ask that guy at the yard sale, he couldn't wait to get rid of that old lawnmower. I like $100 for it. Ooh, had no idea it'd be that much. Is that the best you can do? Well, I might sell for 90. Well, all of a sudden you've made 10 bucks. Now you come in with, well, I wouldn't think I want to pay above 80. You can see how the bargaining begins. It's so easy. Flinch and crunch. But wait a minute. There's even another one-two punch if you want to employ. And it's where you start with the flinch, as always, and then add a trade-off. What's a trade-off? A trade-off is where you offer a concession if they'll give you a concession back. For the guy with the lawnmower, he says, well, how much do you want? A hundred dollars. Oh, I don't want to pay that. Is that the best you can do? He says, yeah, I think it is. Uh, I say, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll pay the hundred dollars if you throw in the weed whacker and those two old gas cans and deliver it in your pickup truck. Notice you're willing to agree to what they want, but you want something in return, a concession that would make it more valuable to you. Let's go to a family negotiating situation. You have a new teen driver in your home, and that teen driver says, you know, I really like to have my own car. Your thinking is, I don't know if they're ready, but it'd be nice if they had their own car. So what do you do when they say, can we have my own car? Well, you flinch him. Oh, I don't know if you can do that. And then you use a trade-off. I'll tell you what, 
in a month, I will consider it if you take care of the family car and wash it every week, vacuum it every other day, and I also want to see your grades coming up. Notice you're willing to give a concession, one, consider getting him his own car if he does something for you, maintains the car, get grades up. You can see how this could really work in family negotiations or your auction business needs a new sound system. And they say, it's $6,000. And you say, wow, that's not gonna be hard to flinch. That's a big number. Wow, is that the best you can do? Well, I think it is. Well, now you come in with a trade-off, but you don't know what to ask. So simply say, well, you know, I'd consider paying that, that $6,000, but you're gonna have to throw something else in to sweeten the deal. What else could you give me? You don't even have to come up with what you want for a trade-off. Let them do it. You'd be surprised how many times they'll throw in something to put the deal together. Look, negotiating is about 90% verbal. A few of our visual cues, facial expressions, maybe things we may write down. But if you don't have the gift, the gift of knowing the right thing to say at every time, you're going to need to practice. Now, you may recognize this fellow, Barney Fife, back in the Andy Griffith and Mayberry days. We used to laugh at Barney because they only trusted him with one bullet. Well, I've seen an awful lot of negotiators that negotiate with only one bullet. Now, that bullet may be, is that the best you can do? But understand, there may be more bullets available. So as I close, let me just give you this example. You're checking into a hotel. You know it's going to cost $100. So that says, got to negotiate. And you're going to flinch him. Oh, wow. Oh, oh, what was that rate again? That's your verbal flinch. And they tell you and you say, I don't see how that could work for me. You're actually asking them to better their price. Or could I have the courtesy of a discount? Or you might say, well, what would I need to do to get a better rate? You see, you need four or five ways to come back at things. Or what else could you offer me if I agreed to that rate? How about a suite at the same price? See, there's always opportunities. And if the clerk doesn't have the authority to give you a discount, apologize for pressing them and saying, I apologize for putting you on the spot. Can I talk to your manager? Trust me, when the manager comes out, you're talking to somebody who has the capacity to give you a good deal. So I would caution you to start getting into more and more terminology that could work. So closing, when do we negotiate? Well, any times there are interests to placate, purposes to accomplish, differences to conciliate, or people to persuade. You look at those four categories, and I think that just captures about every human interaction anybody would have. So where do we go from here? I moved from Pennsylvania to Montana. That's what it looks like out there. And the question is, where do we go from here? May I invite you to visit my website, keepnegotiating.com. On that website, you'll come to my opening page, looks like this, and you'll see that box there, the red arrow points to it, and it identifies access to my 115 negotiating tips. Download them. If you only read one every day, it takes two minutes with your morning coffee, I guarantee you, in the scope of a year, you are gonna see more and more and more better deals. I'm even gonna go on a limb and say, it will save or make you thousands of dollars. One last thought. Maybe you ought to join the CAI program, which meets every March in the University of Indiana. It's been my blessing to teach that for a number of years. Here's some scenes from some of those classes. And you can see in the lower right-hand corner, we even put the class into negotiating exercise where you get to practice what you've learned over an extensive seminar session. And as a handshake in the upper corner says, our goal is to help you get more good deals. So I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy day to join us for our webinar. And above all, I give you this one admonition. Just keep negotiating. Thank you. John, thank you so much. We will now open the floor for questions. If you have not done so already, please submit your question and we will get to as many of them as possible. John, our first question is, I buy a lot of things online. Since I'm not bargaining face-to-face, -face, how do I communicate any attempt to get a discount? Good question. 
negotiating has changed because we are, I know I'm a big online buyer. Amazon knows me very well as to other websites. But I'm going to ask you, as you buy things online, as you go to checkout, have you ever noticed a little box that said, enter discount code, coupon code? That is a big flag to negotiators that says, I can get a better deal. Now, it's going to take a little time. You're going to have to maybe jump off the site, not finish checkout, go to their website of the vendor, whatever they're selling, and simply call them. I love to call them and simply say, hey, I'm about ready to buy your widget online. And I, uh, I'm about ready to check out, but I don't have the discount code. Would you give me the courtesy of the discount code? Over 60% of the time, I get a discount code. Entering it, I get anywhere from 10, 20, I've got as much as 60% off. Now, if you can't call them, contact them. But here as Americans, we're in a hurry. What do we say? I'd rather pay more than I should than waste time contacting somebody else. It takes more effort when you buy things online, but the deals are still possible and vendors are very, very open to making the sale. Don't give up on it. Great. Thank you. Our next question is, what is the best time of day to negotiate with a potential consigner? Oh, wow. Wow. Uh, I guess the biggest thing I would have with regard to a consigner is that you, uh, that you concentrate on a comfortable environment. And when I say that, trying to catch them at a time when they are not going to be distracted. I've, I guess in my business, my background was traditional real estate. I did so much in the evening. I found it to be a really great time. And I know this will sound trite. But it's like, well, before I go to bed, I like to get this deal put to bed. So I've always been a believer in doing things later in the day. So uh, it kind of depends on where you are in the bargaining process. The other concern I have is if there's a lot of information, they're not, they're not used to the auction business, you may want to start early in the day so they are sharper and can understand all the nuances of an auction. That way, they're not overloaded at the end of the day when fatigue might come up. So I don't know there's a definitive best time. It's something you're going to have to kind of a little trial and error on and see how that works. Thank you. And do you have a good thank you line for their consideration? Oh, and whenever anybody gives you even a penny off, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I've always been one to shake a hand. Thank you. I really appreciate the concession. And I really wish I could go at your price, but you know, if I could just get a little bit more, I think we're, we're going to be okay. So uh, absolutely. And I'm a big believer in uh, being over respectful. Uh, Mr. Mrs. I rarely if ever use somebody's first name. And if I do, I even put a Mr. in front of it. Mr. John, Miss Mary, something like that. So absolutely, if somebody gives you a concession, make sure you tell them I appreciate it. Blowing over the concession is literally an insult. You have to stop and tell them you appreciate that. Thank you. And how about when you're negotiating an increase on your services with an existing client? Uh, when you have an existing client, you've done business with them before, this can be really problematic because you may have given them a discount when you uh, to get their initial business. Now you want to do business with them again, and you know what they expect. Two thoughts. One, anytime you give somebody a discount, or even when you give somebody your price, always make sure you put a modifier on it. Well, uh, my fee this year is and you tell them what that fee is, or the cost for my service will be, and my marketing fee this year will be this. Or when you come back for your presentation is, you know, I appreciate you coming back to me, trying to sell your product. I'm really excited to do that. The last time we did it, it was at this rate. Uh, this time the market has changed as our expenses have gone up, and I'm, uh, we're going to be right now at a fee structure, and then you quote what it is. So, and, and don't do it a, too apologetically. 
is everybody seems to understand that things cost more. Or you might even, when you raise your price, raise it a whole lot more than you really want. So when they flinch you and ask you to back off, you can back off to a higher figure, but not as high as you originally asked for. It's called leaving some wiggle room in the negotiation. Ask for more than you want. So when you back off, you both get a good deal. Fantastic. Thank you to all of you who submitted questions. If we did not get to your question, we will pass it along to John for potential follow-up. It is now time for you to give us feedback on today's session. Please see the poll on your screen and answer the questions as swiftly as you are able. Number one, on a scale of one to five, with five being the highest score and one being the lowest, how would you rate today's iSeries presentation? And number two, on a scale of one to five, with five being very likely and one being not at all, how likely are you to recommend iSeries to a friend? And number three, I would like to learn more about NAA's Certified Auctioneers Institute, CAI, in March. Thank you. And if you enjoyed today's iSeries, please consider attending Certified Auctioneers Institute in Bloomington, Indiana, March 22nd through 26, 2020. During this three-year program, attendees spend a week each year on site at Indiana University. Unlike other NAA designations, CAI focuses on the business of the auction industry with a focus on business planning, development, and structure. For more information, visit auctioneers.org CAI. As we close, you will receive a link to today's webinar emailed by the end of this week. In addition, current NAA members can log in and access iSeries archives at auctioneers.org iSeries. Your next iSeries webinar will be Wednesday, April 1st, 2020, and will cover bid calling skills. Please be sure to tell your friends. We will send specific information on that in the near future. Thank you again to John for sharing your insight today. And thanks to all of you for taking part in NAA's iSeries. That concludes today's webinar and have a great day.